Good afternoon. My name is Neil Stimler. I first want to start with some thank yous. I express my heartfelt gratitude to Nick Honeyset and Nancy Proctor for their constant support and guidance. I thank my colleagues in the marketing committee, Vicki Portway, Kate Velasco, Rob Lansfield, Suze Carnes, and Carolyn Downs for their tireless efforts to make this year's conference a success. I thank Nate Solas for all his help posting the session on the website, and I also thank the MCN board. I'm grateful to Rameshri Nivasan, Jeffrey Schnapp, and Martin Weller for their scholarly exchange as I prepare for the panel. I offer my thanks to Amanda French and the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University for the opportunity to participate in the That Camp MCN sessions tomorrow. I thank my panelists whose contributions made this event possible and for their courage to experiment with new ideas and formats so this discussion can be brought to a global audience. I recognize the loving support of my family and dear friends who sustain and enrich my life each day. My remarks are the personal views of Neil Stimler and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, welcome to my presentation of my crowdsourced video panel, Philosophical Leadership Needed for the Future, Digital Humanities Scholars and Museums. Today I will be showing video responses posted on YouTube from an open call to archive, library, museum, and university professionals who reflected on the barriers and benefits of implementing digital humanities in museums. All questions for our virtual panelists should be sent throughout the session directly to our speakers via Twitter using their handles and the hashtags Digital Humanities, Museums, and always MCN2011. You can find the panelist video submissions on a playlist on the MCN Computer Network YouTube channel or by searching the tags listed on the sessions page on the MCN conference website. Please note the session is being recorded. I learned about digital humanities on Twitter. This mode of scholarly inquiry excited me because it combined both my interest in interdisciplinary humanities studies and digital technology. DH, as it's also referred to, brings an innovative approach to research in 21st century digital culture. Mainly found in universities and libraries, digital humanities is concerned with both thinking and doing. It abolishes boundaries between masters and workers, between the degreed and the self-taught, between the pedigreed and the persistent. Digital humanities is a philosophy that enables any person to become a scholar designer, capable of imagining and building a new future in our technological age. As someone who received traditional academic training, but thrived from the creative experimentation made possible by digital technology, I recognize digital humanities as a paradigm shift for all cultural institutions that desire to remain relevant in our new media culture. Technology in museums can no longer be viewed as a tool in service of outdated and restrictive practices that attempts to reinforce hierarchical power structures. The incorporation of digital humanities principles into museums is an ethical imperative for the field. In a world embracing the freedom provided by transcendent forces of social networks, mobile technology, and global communications, the time for libraries, archives, universities, and museums to be judicious in their testing of the digital waters is over. The rest of the world has already immersed itself on the river of the future and the now. The public will progress without connections to cultural institutions if professionals stand at the shoreline shouting empty assertions that fool us into thinking we are preserving the past by resisting democratic change. This is a pivotal moment for a pan-cultural transition into a new age of enlightenment. It will be a digital age made from humanity's common wealth of knowledge and resources, forged collaboratively in centers dedicated to the compassionate service of others, built by workers with diverse skills, ideas, and heritages. It is time for museums to reimagine their relationships with collections, scholarly practice, and those dedicated to the evolution of culture through memory and meaning-making institutions. So here are all of our panelists. You can begin tweeting them now as you like. Uh, you'll, the, each panelist's name will also be shown with their video presentation as well. And here are some of the tags you can use throughout the session as well. So our panelists were asked to consider the following questions. How can museums advance beyond the continuation of traditional practice utilizing digital tools to a new mode of scholarship and interpretation that seeks to understand the meanings of collections in a new media culture? Two, what is required of museums to establish digital humanities research centers within the framework of existing institutions? And three, why might interdisciplinary and non-traditional scholars from outside the established professional ranks make the best leaders for a needed inspired change in the philosophical direction of museums? 
Let's go to our panelists. with Michael Edson, Director of New Media and Technology at the Smithsonian Institution. And now we have Lori Phillips from the Children's Museum of Indianapolis and also Wikipedian, and a good friend and colleague. And uh, a special guest with her, her son, Teddy. I'm Lori. Hi. I'm Lori, and this is Teddy. Say hi, Teddy. Hi. How old are you? Three. Do you like museums? Yeah. What museums do you go to? Um, the Hidden Museum. <laughs> do you go to the Children's Museum? Mm-hmm. What do you see there? Um, dinosaur bones. Do you have one to show? Mm-hmm. Show them your dinosaur bones. Lift it up really good. The Montosaurus. What other dinosaurs have you seen there? Um, Ophrophosaurus. Really? Mm-hmm. No way. Yes, yes way. <laughs> What other dinosaurs? Um, T Rex. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. T Rex and Bucky. What else? What's your favorite thing about the museums? Um, dinosaur bones. <laughs> really? Uh huh. Did a paleontologist give you this? Uh huh. Do you remember his name? Um, Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> I don't think a Wikipedia paleontologist gave you that. <laughs> All right, Teddy. Anything else you want to talk about museums? No. Nope. nope. All right. As an emerging museum professional and a mom, I love to think about what museums will be like when Teddy's older. How will his perspective be incorporated into the museum experience? For years, museums have discussed how to better include the community's voice in the interpretation of culture, and we all know the social web to be an incredible tool for making this happen. We've been experimenting with a lot of participatory digital experiences, 
but now we have to use those visitor contributions in a meaningful way in exhibits. Visitors' contributions shouldn't be on the periphery, but should be reworked into the core of museum interpretation. Just as the web has become more social, it has also become more open. This is a core issue in digital humanities today. In the coming years, museums, libraries, and archives will have more pressure to consider what of their copyright policies are overly restrictive and unnecessarily preventing reuse. Museums will need to reconsider the role of control versus stewardship in order to remain relevant and accountable to the public. Everyone will need to address these shifts and expectations, and museums need to be more deliberate in working together with libraries and archives and, ar and universities rather than working in a vacuum. The museums who will thrive will be those that work more closely with universities, archives, and libraries in much broader contexts than the typical one-off projects and programs. To make these changes, I don't think it's necessary to diminish the role of those professionals already in the field. I regret the negative view of museum studies graduate programs. It's useful for up-and-coming museum professionals to have a solid foundation in the theories and issues present in the field. My museum studies program introduced me to the landmark articles in our field that are moving us forward and led me to connect with the museum professional community in ways I never would have on my own. That's not to say that unique perspectives don't have their place, but it should not be at the expense of those with strong theoretical backgrounds in museum studies. Together, we can contribute to, um, to we can all continue to build on the conversation and progress. Work for now. So this is uh, Ryan Anthony Donaldson. He's an archivist in New York for a reality company and also uh, the social media coordinator for the Archivist Roundtable in New York City. Greetings. My name is Ryan Anthony Donaldson, and I will be participating in the crowdsourced video panel entitled Philosophical Leadership Needed for the Future, Digital Humanities Scholars in Museums. And that will be part of the 39th Annual Museum Computer Network Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, November 16th to 19th. I currently am the Communications and Outreach Coordinator for the Archivist Roundtable of Metropolitan New York, and I also work as an archivist for a real estate company in New York City. I have the Twitter account at Rye Archives, and I also co-manage the Archivist Roundtable Twitter account, which is at Archivist RT. I will be answering three questions that were sent to me by Neil Stimler, the moderator and organizer of this panel. The first question is, how can museums advance beyond the continuation of traditional practices utilizing digital tools to a new mode of interpretation that seeks to understand the meanings of collections and scholarship in a new media culture? Museums have built trust with the public uh, through respecting and asserting the authenticity of historical objects and thus engage in a tradition of public service. The AAM Code of Ethics states that museums are, quote, organized as public trusts holding their collections and information as a benefit for those that they were established to serve." Unquote. Today's media culture, and whether it is new or not is another matter, includes a generation growing up with Apple and Google, Google products and the complementary computer devices, and their parents are modeling similar behavior to them with these products as they all seek to understand and receive information and communicate with one another. To help respond in service to the public, as well as benefit them today, museums are asked to look within themselves and their walls and utilize digital tools along with refining strategic plans to meet and hopefully exceed the expectations of new audiences and constituencies. Museums find themselves in an unparalleled and unique position to demonstrate the presence of the past and the value of authenticity. Museums are challenged because managing perceptions of authenticity requires a thorough understanding of audiences' expectations, beliefs, and preconceptions. In terms of today's media culture, these matters and metrics can be rapidly evolving and seemingly inconsistent. An understanding of technolog technological trends in emerging consumer products is necessary as well. Museums and all cultural institutions are asked to respond to this complex challenge. The second question is, what is required of museums to establish digital humanities research centers within the framework of existing institutions? In my view, this program seems to provide a needed testing grounds 
for a collective set of individuals to engage in the work of digital humanities. I would think that to ensure success, museums would be required to connect their current and future audiences with programming that leverages digital tools and museum events that draw from and respond to media culture. The online presence would also need to complement and extend the museum experience. Surveys and focus groups can help museums understand emerging trends within the digital humanities field as well. The ability to collaborate would also leverage resources available for the museum and extend the museum's impact and increase the possibility of forming partnerships and attracting sponsorships. And the third and final question is, why might interdisciplinary and non-traditional scholars from outside the established professional ranks make the best leaders needed for inspired change in the philosophical direction of museums? In my responses, audiences today have demonstrated an audiovisual appetite with increasingly brief attention spans. However, the culture within museums prizes patience, traditions of iterative scholarship, and long-term care of artifacts in perpetuity. The interdisciplinary and non-traditional scholars may be able to bring about innovative ways of communicating with today's audiences through emerging and evolving technological methods that current established museum leadership may not be in a position to recognize or feel too stifled to enact. Working with them would help provide the ability to engage with audiences in new ways, as well as becoming more relevant. Thank you. Try to go back to Marit for a second. This is Alina. She's a digital native and she's smart. She's already playing around with these. Who knows what tools she'll have at her disposal as she grows up. I like to think of her as a non-traditional scholar from outside the professional establishment. When we go to the museum, she, just, she doesn't do this. She wants to make her own stuff. way she's learning new skills and getting new insights into herself and the world around her. Day by day she's becoming a scholar in her own life. And like we all do, she's looking for inspiration from what others have made before her. That's what collections mean to her. She's used to being able to do this kind of stuff. I hope we don't expect her to grow up to be interacting with museums in this way. Thank you. Next, we have another uh, Wikipedian from Barcelona who is at the uh, Museo Picasso. This is Alex Sinoe, goes by Kippelboy. Shout out to Alex. Hello, hello. I'm Alex Sinojo, an emerging museum professional from Barcelona and also a Wikipedian specialized in working with cultural institutions. This video is part of the 39th Annual Museum Computer Network Conference Panel philosophical leadership needed for the future, digital humanities, scholars in museums, led by Neil Steimer. So, question first. In my opinion, museums can only advance by opening their doors to share their accumulated knowledge with the world. Communication is all about telling stories, and museums' collections are plenty of them. They must let people explore their collections and discover all these great treasures hidden inside, not only the highlights, so question two. First thing required is a true interest. It's necessary to create a profitable mid-term relationship 
that should be useful both for the institution and the people involved in the project. So, question three. Maybe museums have focused too long only inside, comparing themselves only to other museums, while society has started several important changes. It's called the belly button effect. People coming from another sectors can bring some brand new fresh air to the cultural sector with new points of view. Next, we have uh, three panelists, actually, from the University of Iowa. And this video was, was recorded by Melody Dorock, who is a library student there in Digital Humanities. And she did a really interesting interpretation of my questions. She brought the Special Collections Archivist, a uh, digital researcher, and a museum educator together for the panel and asked them all the questions together. And they sat down, and here's what they had to say. I think that, that museums, museums and archives can advance, can advance um, beyond traditional modes and methods um, of digital tools by, by trying them out, actually, by trying different digital tools out. Um, for example, at the Old Capitol Museum, I don't think that we would have with the idea of getting iPads for a new exhibit um, if we didn't have a student interested in making a website that was accessible to an iPad or that could be shown on an iPad and that was really interested in working with the tools um, and then we just thought that might be a great idea for another exhibit down the road and so incorporating um, new tools trying them out as much as possible, um, being, being open to um, failure, I think, um, is important. Um, however, I mean, being very careful about it, you don't just want to fail, of course. Um, but approaching it with, approaching new practices um, with an open mind really important. So I think from the library archive side of things, um, one of the things that that we could do in terms of new modes of interpretation is actually get more comfortable with the fact that, that we can do some of that interpretation. Um, that rather than just sort of being a, a place where we absorb all this stuff so that others can use it, which mm -hmm. we will still do, um, mm -hmm. we can recognize the fact that we've developed these really large, very complicated databases, mm -hmm. um, collections of information about historical resources, about books, about archive collections, and that we can interpret that. We can step back from the individual pieces mm -hmm. and look at the mass of information that we've put together over many, many decades and start to analyze it and interpret it, mm -hmm. which I think would then uh, possibly open up new ways to understand the things that we have. Mm -hmm. but I think also, you know, allowing um, users to participate in the archives mm -hmm. and giving yes. them mm -hmm. ways to tag and comment, uh, even upload their own historic images from the university, say, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but to make it more of a two-way street than it has been traditionally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know the Old Capitol Museum was inspired by the Civil War Diaries project um, to offer QR codes um, to the user to visit the library's website to interact with um, the digital version of the, mm -hmm. of the diary. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I think um, visitors can then take ownership of, um, of a 
piece of history. Mm -hmm. And so definitely if there's, you know, we can continue to combine the traditional and the, um, the new digital tools that way where we engage the visitor. Um, because like you said, we have this mass of information and the more that we can make it accessible. I think that you have to have really strong collaborations mm -hmm. with researchers, that you can't go and build this in isolation, that you may have the collections and the expertise about the collections, but that it really needs to be done in close partnership with um, humanities scholars mm -hmm. um, and with technologists, um, mm -hmm. and so that you have this sort of um, wonderful trio of expertise that can come together and uh, jointly develop the center. and bring the associated buy-in from, from those three corners of campus. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the things about the process that, um, mm -hmm. that that's really great is that it is within the framework of existing institutions, mm -hmm. but it's a way to bring people together around an idea, a project, a concept that um, didn't always happen in the past, whereas mm -hmm. now just the whole concept of, of, of a research center. Um, you have to have people with different skills and different backgrounds mm -hmm. coming together to work on a common project. And that's the sort of thing that we talk about a lot, um, but going through the process of setting up a center, it, it actually does it. You have to have people coming together or else it just won't work. Mm -hmm. And I think definitely creating that sense of community mm -hmm. uh, or kind of into having multiple talents, multiple people um, working together is really important and um, the willingness to collaborate and to continue on a project I think is extremely important. Mm -hmm. so. And I think that beyond just setting up um, Oops, the technology and the website and that kind of thing, you need to do community building and that's um, public engagement, uh, talks, workshops, you have to nurture the community so that everyone can um, begin to take advantage of the center. Not pitch it up here or pitch it down here, but try to remember the continuum of, of scholars and where they're at with their digital skills and, and understanding of what technology can do for their research. From my vantage point in Special Collections, and I think from a museum perspective as well, we're dealing with non-traditional scholars and people from outside established professional ranks all the time. Oh, this is um, the new concept. Mm -hmm. So, and I think mm -hmm. that is often the place from which uh, ideas about direction come from. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, we're thinking about various types of audiences when we're developing programs, when we're thinking about the collections we're building, let alone you know, how we're gonna take advantage of new tools and techniques. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, even mentioning something like, something as simple as QR codes, we're doing that for non-professionals, mm -hmm. you know, more right. than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a way in which a, a practice can come along that gets incorporated into what mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, coming from a museum standpoint, um, working with various community partners to offer their knowledge and to kind of guide um, projects. Um, we have to, I feel, we have to acknowledge that their, um, their own, they're in their own professional right, I think. Um, from a, say for example, from a living history museum side, we may not, you know, the person who knows how to make a fire outside, you know, when it comes down to right. it, when we need that for an mm -hmm. interpretation, um, if they don't have a, a, you know, a master's degree or a doctorate or, you know, or a degree for that matter, if they know what they're doing, though, if they have that knowledge, um, that's very important. I think that, you know, established professional ranks, uh, th those in, in those ranks, are already doing things to, to draw out uh, non-traditional scholars and, and mm -hmm. sort of see what sticks. I think with Greg's Civil War 
project and putting up uh, diaries for public transcription. Mm -hmm. uh, that engaged a public that, yeah. that I didn't know. I mean, I knew that Civil War um, folks were enthusiastic, but I did not know that someone would individually transcribe 400 pages on her own. Uh, wow. This, you know, and, yeah. and so we've, we've developed, the, yeah, we've developed this uh, cadre of sort of power transcribers who are very wow. engaged in the stories of these soldiers and who, um, you know, uh, are can are doing this well well after the publicity of the, of the mm -hmm. collection and the project have faded. And so um, mm -hmm. I think now they're leading us to think about expanding the project to non-Civil War materials and that kind of thing. So that's, I think, a really yeah, recent it, example. It sets a direction then, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. that, that we'll we pursue. Go. Our next panelist is Micah Vandergriff from the uh, from Florida. He was also in Brooklyn for a while, working at the Brooklyn Public Library and doing a project in conjunction with the Brooklyn Museum. He has the uh, blog Hack Lib School and is a great innovative guy on the job market. If anyone's interested. Hi, my name is Micah Vandergrift, and I'm a librarian currently working as a project manager in scholarly communications at Florida State University. You can find me around the web using the handle Micah Vandergrift. I'm proud to be a contributor to this panel, Philosophical Leadership Needed for the Future, Digital Humanities Scholars and Museums, which is part of the 39th Annual Museum Computer Network Conference. I'll keep my comments brief, as I'm still newish to the field and my interactions and observations are based mainly on readings and experiences I've had as a student and new professional. Here's a quick story. I had the pleasure of working at the Brooklyn Public Library in New York on a cooperative grant project with the Brooklyn Museum and the Brooklyn Historical Society. This project is creating a shared digital collection of historic photos of Brooklyn and is still underway, although I have moved on. One day at work I was tweeting about how cool it was to collaborate with different types of institutions and I got a tweet back from Ethan Wattrell, a scholar at Michigan State University. He excitedly was asking me if the Brooklyn Museum had any plans to digitize their slide collection from an Egyptian archaeological dig or something along those lines, and he expressed with many exclamation points and extended syllables how valuable access to those images would be to his research. This was the first time I had ever encountered the idea that museum collections could be of extreme value to working scholars and were more than institutions for pres preserving and sometimes showing old objects, old things. To be fair, the Brooklyn Museum is on the cutting edge of a lot of progressive technological ideas, and to their credit, but it was an eye-opening moment for me. Lately, I've been thinking and rethinking an idea that probably already exists somewhere, that the digital humanities have this capacity and are becoming the space in which public history exists. For now, we're seeing this enacted from universities outward, uh, digital humanities centers building tools, using databases, creating visualizations, and opening up worlds of knowledge compiled and organized by scholars, librarians, archivists, and others. As the predominant institutions of public history, it would seem that museums and, and historical societies would naturally follow suit, opening up collections, creating collaboration, and generally working to deepen their connection with the public and also scholars who are beginning to expect access to all these institutions have to offer. The subtitle of this panel could be read two ways. How does the digital humanities scholar gain greater access to museum resources, or is it time to employ digital humanities scholars as staff in museums? Both are relevant inquiries. As an early co career librarian, I prefer not to give advice to my superiors on how to move forward, but per perhaps I can offer some insight from my perspective as an interested party. Uh, public history in institutions have an incredible opportunity to continue to evolve and engage the public with capital P, and the key, which is continually echoed in digital humanities circles, and this is my first point, is being open to new collaborations. Project Chart, the previously mentioned project that I uh, worked with at the Brooklyn Public Library, in my mind is a great example of this, bringing together different types of institutions who all essentially have the same goals to work together on providing meaning to objects 
through and across the digital space we share. Secondly, developing these collaborations may require some non-traditional efforts. We talk a lot about silos in the university between departments, colleges, administrative offices, and in my experience, those same divisions exist in other types of institutions too. Beginning to think outside of those boundaries and imagine projects that incorporate different types of skills and giving teams a space, physical or otherwise, to have conversations and begin to learn how to speak one another's language will open opportunities that we haven't yet imagined. Practically, I'd love to see museums and libraries uh, to that end free up some, some percentage of work time for motivated employees to really start to explore their interests. That'd be the kind of structural change that would begin to avail digital humanities work to be done in these kind of institutions. Lastly, I think it's clear that folks who will be interested in this type of work, collaborative, broad-reaching digital projects, will be unique. But good news from a recent library school graduate, myself, there are plenty of soon-to-be graduates with skills ranging from technical expertise to amazing depth of knowledge on a variety of topics, and many of them are more than prepared to be innovative. So, and this will, is where I will offer a piece of advice, hire someone with good ideas. Hire someone who expresses interest in digital humanities but may lack some skills that they can build up. Set up a table at a job fair at a, a local school and start mining schools in your area for computer science students, uh, communications and new media folks, digital historians, or a good old-fashioned liberal studies major. I think it's time to acknowledge that much of the innovation and progression that we're hoping for in museums, uh, libraries, universities, government, will come from non-traditional, think-outside-the-box types. And luckily, they're out and about now. If there's one point I'd like to get across about what I see as the key to adapting the philosophical uh, leadership in museums, it'd be this. The power structures are changing. Hire good, interesting people with big imaginations and trust and support them to do good, interesting work with your stuff. Thank you very much, from, and goodbye from Tallahassee, Florida. I want to make, I want to explore. Hi there. My name is Simon Tanner and I'm an academic in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. I'm also the Director of Digital Consultancy Services there and I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg where I'm attending the International Conference of African Digital Libraries and Archives. And I'm sorry I can't be at MCN this year. Now, a few moments ago, you heard from some proto-digital humanists, my sons, Joseph and Alex, and I agree with everything they have to say, of course. And I need to think that the digital humanities is about creativity, discovery, and making things. And so the challenge is to enable us not just access to museum collections, but to allow us to make new things with our research. If we can wed our intellectual capacity with you and your museum collections, then we can be more creative and powerful together. We also need to break through another barrier, which is not just about getting academics and museums together, but about getting museums to share with each other, so that our research can attach with your museum collection and also create a multidisciplinary perspective and enable multiple sources from many museums to come together to enable that research. In short, what I'm looking for here is a perspective that's about education, that's about enlightenment, but also about entertainment. So in museums, open up your collections, actively work with us digital humanists to help us discover and create together Let's share physical spaces so that academics can be embedded or in residence and available to the public and seen and engaged with by the public in your museums. 
And if you're thinking about research centers, let's make them transparent and visible, not just at the results stage when we've got something to show, but also throughout the research process and whilst we're creating together. As memory institutions, I believe museums are about connecting with the past and creating the future. So let's go do that together. Thank you. I want to have fun. fun. Tweet down at Simon Tanner. I'm delighted by the amount of family participation in this panel. It's been terrific to see that. And so for my, my closer today, I am delighted to present Nick Honeysett, who is the head of administration at the J. Paul Getty Museum. And this video and Michael Edson's video have been very popular so far for the whole panel. Both have over 100, 100 hits already before the presentation today. And uh, Nick's video has been picked up by several blogs as well. So seems to be a fan favorite. So let me answer the first question, uh, starting with a quote. I love quotes from this guy, Albert Einstein. We can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Wise words from a fellow physicist. Um, and this from Apple. Think different. Their 1984 uh, slogan, which really was attempting to change the paradigm of, of personal computing. So put another way and put into the context of uh, this question, we can't solve uh, digital problems using analog thinking. Museums are steeped in the physicality uh, of what we do and, and the, the solution to the challenge that question one poses is how do we let go of the physical sense of ourselves and address this, this other audience and these new tools. So we're steeped in physicality. So for collecting institutions, it's about the real thing. It's about standing in front of a real object, um, and from our institutional missions, from our educational missions, even from our business models, our revenue streams, it's all about being there. Um, and the future is, is being elsewhere, and we need to figure out how to uh, change that paradigm and get away from the physical sense of ourselves. Uh, so Nicholas Sirota, director of the Tate, summed it up um, very elegantly in a conversation with Neil McGregor uh, last year, I think. I'll read it. The future of the museum may be rooted in the buildings they occupy, but it will address audiences across the world. A place where people across the world will have a conversation. Those institutions which take up this notion fastest and furthest will be the ones that have authority in the future. And he went on to say, the growing challenge is to encourage curatorial teams to work in the online world as much as they do in the galleries. So the solution to this question is about people, um, it's about their training, and it's about their education. We need to figure out how to get museum leadership to think different, um, but we need to figure out how to inform them to think different. And really the crux is that, of that is about relevance, and it's about helping them understand the relevance of all this digital stuff. Uh, an interesting, I see an interesting thing, it used to be that curators would come into curatorial departments and the, the senior curator would, would teach the junior curator everything uh, that they need to know about their craft. Uh, what I'm seeing now is junior curators coming in and teaching the senior curators about what it is to live in this world of user-generated con uh, content, of dialogue, of interpretation, of storytelling, of narrative. It's an interesting paradigm shift and we need to figure out how to help those, that old guard steeped in centuries of tradition, how to get them to think different. The answer to this question is the same. It's about relevance um, and it's about um, helping institutions understand the relevance of providing uh, these research centres. You, know, you have to believe that the, the way that the education system is going right now, there is a huge opportunity to provide uh, primary research materials and provide an environment for um, academic research within these institutions as we look to kind of broaden our mandate within, uh, within communities. It's all about relevance. I think the answer to this question is within the question itself. It's about non-tradition. You know, if you want to get people to think different, if you want to inspire people to change, uh, you need either a carrot or a stick. 
Uh, a carrot would be interdisciplinary people, you know, the non-traditional scholar, people with expertise within and without the, um, the, the culture. But also the stick, you know, there are some huge economic pressures um, coming down um, the pike for, for, our, um, for our industry, as it were. And I think these may help to uh, inspire creativity and, and innovation but I much prefer it would be uh, the carrot approach and to bring in a diverse set of intellectual skills and conversations that would help uh, stimulate this change. And now it's my turn to answer the questions for the panel. So just as a refresher, since we've watched some, some clips for a while. So the first question was, how can museums advance beyond the continuation of traditional practices utilizing digital tools to a new mode of interpretation that seeks to understand the meanings of collections and scholarship in new media culture. Museums must integrate the use of social technology into daily work practices, so the process of our labor is open and transparent. We cannot allow fear to hinder the potential for earnest and thoughtful connections with constituents. Relationship building requires risk, but now is the time to push the boundaries that define who we are and what we do as cultural service institutions. If museums are to thrive in a new media culture, we must recognize that the value of our collections and content is not defined by their physical nature. The objects in our galleries, publications at events, are all part of a constantly evolving continuum of cultural creation that is the common right of all people. If that common culture cannot be accessed or shared with new media tools, then it does not exist. The value of li liberal arts rests not in artifacts, but the bounty of knowledge that can be experienced and used by anyone to discover new understandings of the human experience. For new interpretation of collection to be possible, museums must share their authority with constituents. New scholarship will be built in a collaborative space that empowers museum staff, digital humanities researchers, and non-traditional scholars to solve problems together. The locus of interpretation has permanently shifted from the arcane guardians of tradition to the conscientious conductors of a new free media culture. The second question. What is required of museums to establish digital humanities research centers within the framework of existing institutions? Museums can initiate digital humanities centers in their own institutions immediately. Exploring working groups should be formed by enthusiastic librarians, technologists, curators, and educators already in the museum to plan the implementation of centers. These existing staff members would benefit greatly from consultation with digital humanities researchers outside the home institution to offer fresh perspectives and guide the planning process. It is preferable to reassign the existing staff to digital humanities centers on a full-time basis. But if resources do not permit this at the present time, a percentage of staff time should be developed solely for digital humanities projects separate from other assigned duties. Digital humanities centers must have hybrid presence in museums, both physical and digital. They should be formed as autonomous departments reporting directly to museum directors. Centers may receive financial support from government grants, foundations, as well as crowdsourced and microfunding initiatives. All phases of the formation of centers, their day-to-day -day activities, and future projects should be publicly documented online on dashboards. Any tool, project, or publication produced by a center staff should be multimodal, mobile-enabled, and licensed for reuse with Creative Commons licensing. Centers will be responsible for community outreach to other centers and cultural institutions for long-term collaborative projects. Fellowships and residencies should provide academics and non-traditional scholars opportunities to do in-depth research with the center's staff and resources. Centers will host That Camp Unconferences annually on topics of interest submitted by scholars and the general public. Digital humanities staff shall play critical roles in the acquisitions, exhibitions, conservation, collections management, and special events processes. The center shall serve as the networked hub of all museum activity. And question three. Why might interdisciplinary and non-traditional scholars from outside the established professional ranks make the best leaders needed for inspired change in the philosophical direction of museums. Non-traditional scholars are essential for digital humanities to take philosophical roots in museums. Although museums may have interested staff within the institution, museums will not succeed in transforming their essential identities from keepers of things to distributors of and makers of knowledge without help of outside collaborators. Non-traditional scholars are a global resource that offer new insights and direction for the field. Who are non-traditional scholars? They have interdisciplinary interests, diverse and in technological skill sets, a passion for creativity and innovation, and they emerge from a myriad of social and cultural backgrounds. 
Non-traditional scholars may not have advanced degrees or any academic degrees at all for that matter. Museums cannot measure their contributions by existing academic standards. The proof of non-traditional scholars' value is in the very work they produce, whether it's a blog, an ebook, a data visualization, or an open database system. The most important aspect of non-traditional scholars is their ethical orientation towards openness. Learning from others, exchanging stories, exploring new ideas, and making work that can be used without hindrance to the creativity of others are core principles of openness. Non-traditional scholars are willing to make sacrifices in the service of others. In word and in deed, they are the agents of the philosophical change that is revolutionizing humanity in the digital age. Thank you. Please continue to submit videos to the playlist if you're interested. You can contact me at my Twitter handle there and uh, ask me questions that you have throughout the day on Twitter. And if you want to ask me a question now, you're welcome to do that too, but please make sure you tweet it as well so that everybody else can participate in the conversation.